So I'm Chris Kleindienst. I own Left Bank Books. And Elena and Aaron are at the store as well, doing all the important stuff. Um, I also want to thank the Schlafly Library. Uh, Kiana is um, fabulous, and the library is, you know, librarians have a target on their back right now from yeah. our state legislature. Yes. So uh, we love and support them. Yeah. Is it? Is it oh, Kiana, can you? Um, yeah. Thank you. Sound, our sound engineer, library manager was about to leave. <laughs> Uh, is this any better? Does this work better? Okay. So yes, so as I was saying, librarians are badass and we love them. <laughs> so tonight's event is also made possible in part by our 501c3, the Left Bank Books Foundation, and by you, our community. So with your support by purchasing books by the authors we host, we're able to continue bringing authors to St. Louis, both the ones you've grown to love and the ones you will grow to love. <laughs> and you can further support our nonprofit work. Um, we have a River City Readers Program that brings authors and free books to St. Louis public school students. Uh, we also have our award-winning Literacy and Justice Project, which opposes uh, book banning and gives away some of those banned books for free. Um, uh, you can do that by making donations. You can become officially a friend of Left Bank Books, and there's stuff at the table if you're curious. So thank you very much for uh, making reading and books sustainable. It has been a month, I think we can probably all agree on that. Um, <laughs> one of the things that has sustained me has been Margaret Rankle's quietly marvelous essays in The Comfort of Crows, which is her newest book. Um, Margaret is the author also, as you also know, of Late Migrations, The Natural History of Love and Loss and Graceland, at last, Notes on Hope and Heartache from the American South, which won the 2022 Penn Diamondstein Spielvogel Award for the, um, for the Art of the Essay, which, congratulations, then, as well. <laughs> She's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, where her essays appear weekly. The founding editor of Chapter 16, a daily literary publication of humanities in Tennessee, and a graduate of Auburn University and the University of South Carolina. She lives in Nashville, the other um, blue dot in a red state. <laughs> so tonight, uh, we're going to start. Uh, Margaret is generously going to read from her new book a little bit, and then she and I will have a bit of a conversation. Uh, welcome, by the way, to our virtual audience behind the screen there. Hello. Um, and, and then, of course, you'll have time for some questions. And let's, uh, let's officially welcome Margaret Reckle to say thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for coming out. I feel like it's um, a special imposition to ask people to come out on a work night it, when it's gotten to be like this. You know, it's getting darker, it's getting colder, the impulse to hibernate is very strong, and so I know what it costs you to come out here during rush hour on a work night, and I appreciate well, it. Well, we're happy to do it for you, Mark. Thank you for coming to St. Louis. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. This book really is brand, brand new. I haven't entirely learned how to talk about it yet. It came out last Tuesday, oh, okay. so I'm still I'm still figuring out what it is that people want to know, and um, and and also I'm still figuring out how to answer the questions. But I do know that one question that I get over and over again in interviews, and and just in the time I've been on book tour, people want to know why the comfort of crows, and they want to know that even if. They've already read the book, and because if you've read the book, you know 
that there are more bluebirds in it than crows. <laughs> there are um, quite a few skinks. Um, a rat snake appears from time to time. It's not really a book about crows. And for some people, that's very disappointing um, <laughs> to learn. But there is a reason why it's called The Comfort of Crows. And I actually had to fight pretty hard for the title because my, um, my editor, who is young enough for me to have given birth to, um, <laughs> thought it sounded like it could have been part of the um, Game of Thrones series, oh. um, a series which I have neither read nor watched one minute of Yay. on the screen. So I can understand. And then I started looking. And yes, it actually does sound like it belongs to that series. And I can see why it might be problematic. But then I told her this story. Do y'all know the author Ruta Sapetis? Yes. She's from Nashville, too, or she is in Nashville. Um, and her first book um, is called Between Shades of Gray. And she tells this absolutely hilarious story about going out on book tour. The very first week on, on book tour, she's in an airplane. And she's sitting there. Um, next to a man they strike up a conversation and he says um wh where are you going are you, are you going to see family you going to see friends she says no i'm on book tour and he said oh what's the name of your book and she says between shades of gray and he goes oh my wife loves that <laughs> <laughs> and she actually thinks that the confusion may have helped sell more books <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's why i won this this uh a dispute or not, but there is a reason why I call it the, the Comfort of Crows, and I thought I'd read part of an essay called The Crow Family. If you've got your, if you've got your text before you, it begins on page, uh, the essay begins on page 45, but I'm going to pick up on page 47. Of all the backyard birds, the corvids, the crows, and the blue jays are most familiar to me. They don't nest in plain view as the bluebirds do, or stand on the fence posts and sing like the mockingbirds. They don't conduct daring aerial exploits before my very eyes, close enough to touch as the hummingbirds do in summer. I love the crows not because they're exotic, but because they are kindred creatures, I see in them my own kind. Corvids are uncannily like us in unexpected ways. Ravens have been known to windsurf at the beach, holding a bit of driftwood in their feet for ballast. Crows will ride down snowy roofs on flat objects mm -hmm. they put to use as sleds. Again and again, they haul their toy to the roof line and toboggan down the slope <laughs> in what looks for all the world like playing. Mm -hmm. After they quarrel, crows take care to make up with one another but they can recognize human faces and will hold a grudge against someone who frightens them or causes them harm. They can even teach their children to maintain the grudge, <laughs> the Corbett equivalent of the Hatfields and the McCoys. When a crow dies, other crows gather around its body to mourn, to bid their friend farewell, we don't know, but they are our nearest avian kin, living together in families, creating tools, and solving problems, even in a way, making art out of found objects. They stalk along the ground as though they own the place, like certain people I know. <laughs> Despite their legendary intelligence, I have the same issues with corvids that I have with raptors. I love them, but love is sometimes a struggle, especially during the breeding season 
when they poach the young from songbird nests to feed to their own young. During migration seasons, crows will devour the exhausted songbirds themselves. Nothing is harder to love about the natural world or the human world than its ceaseless brutality. But in winter, crows become my favorites again. They are perfectly designed for this season, black against a gray sky, a three-dimensional silhouette. Unlike other birds who grow quiet in winter, crows continue to speak to one another even on the coldest days. American crows remain together as a family through the seasons with parents and young from several nesting years working together to find food and fend off predators. I watch them grooming one another in the high branches. One crow will nibble at another crow's head or neck, and the other crow will tilt its face this way and that, presenting the itchy places for attention one by one. I remember the way my mother, when I crawled into the big bed between her and dad, would run her fingers lightly down my arm, the way dad would scratch my back. I think of the way I wiggled too, twisted this way and that to make sure they reached every inch of skin. Crow families always recall to me my grandparents who lost their home to fire when their family was very young and had to move in with my great grandparents' house just down the road. There must have been a time when my grandparents considered moving back out, but they never did. Maybe they came to understand the practicality of a multi-generational household. The way there was always someone home to help with the children, or later, after my great-grandparents grew frail, with the older generation. Maybe they simply couldn't imagine living apart by then. Maybe they just loved living together, all three generations, in the same small house. Those days are gone. Even during the pandemic, when the multi-generational household became more common than it had been for generations, my sons seemed to feel something almost like shame about coming home, as though home were by definition a place a child grows up to escape. How do you meet a life partner or even just a date? If you have to admit you live with your parents. <laughs> this situation does not recall to them the stories they have heard of my grandparents, of my mother and my uncle, of Papa Doc and Mama Alice gathered on the porch of a mild winter evening while light streaked the sky and oak limbs creaked in the wind. How they sat together and talked, or maybe just listened. I am trying to listen. Sometimes the neighborhood crows sit in the branches and call out one to another, a talk that continues even as they fly toward their roost in the last light of these short days. The crow's caw is recognizable to the human ear but the birds actually have more than 20 different calls, not even counting the subsong sounds they make, clacking and cooing and rattling and clicking. I don't know what the crows are saying to the other crows, but I like to listen in. It's a gift to watch them living their intricate lives so visibly while the trees are bare. This is their world, 
but I have no trouble understanding what they are saying to the red-tailed hawk. Away, go away. It may be their message for me as well. Thanks, y'all. That was lovely. Are we going to stand up? Um, oh, no, I'm just going to have to, you know, okay. we don't have a stage crew. <laughs> Uh, Chris, the stage crew. <laughs> I and we apologies for the lights. There's no control. There's something wrong with them. Um, but I figure it's really we'll live. It's just lights, right? It's just lights. And I apologize for having a plastic bottle of water. I don't want to, but I do. So uh, let me open it. That was wonderful. I just want to you know, just read <laughs> every night a story. Um, let's back up just a little and talk about the structure of this book, if you would. It's a book of days, and there's some praise songs in it. And if you read any of her other books, and there, it's a, you have a structure kind of similar. Through, they're short pieces. And, they sort of talk to one another in a way. Um, but this one has a very specific organization. Can you talk about what moved you to put it together this way? It's 52 essays. Oh, yours is working as well. It's got a little red dot. So oh, you turn up. Okay. okay. Try this. Better? Yeah. yeah. It, there, this book is, is um, made up of 52 essays one for each week of the year. Um, and then it has little, I don't know, like little lanyards um, called praise songs that occur <coughs> randomly throughout. And are not, no, none of the praise songs are longer than one page. And there's, there's, a, there's both a um, idealistic and a very pragmatic reason for the praise songs, but I'll get to that in a minute. The structure of the book this is the kind of thing that those of you who are writers, you'll understand what I mean when I say this is a gift from God. Um, to have the structure just laid out for you before you even begin makes things so much easier. I tried so hard with my first book to create a structure. I laid them, I printed them all out, all these little essays. I laid them out on the floor. I looked at them one way, moved them around gather them all back up, try it again the next day. It went on forever. I could not find any kind of way to put them in an order that made any kind of sense. Because it's one thing to write a personal essay, and another thing to write a personal essay that has to, as Chris described, talk to the other essays in the book. And the, the, the structure has to reinforce that meaning. And, but this book was really easy. And the idea for it came to me from somebody like y'all. I was on book tour with Late Migrations. And I had this weekly responsibility to the New York Times. And my publisher at the time didn't want me to take any time off from the Times. Because um, in, they, they kept calling my column the golden ticket. Like more people are going to see and hear about this book from my byline in the Times than from any kind of ad that you would ever place anywhere. So I would go out for a few days and come back and write a column, go out for a few days and come back and write a column. And that went on for weeks and weeks. So by the time I was, you know, coming toward the end of the book tour, five months later, most of the people who came out had already read the, the book. And they started saying it. And over and over and over again, people would say, I just slowed down. I don't want to hurry through this book. I just want to read it one per night or one per morning, maybe two if they're really short. I'm trying to make myself slow down. And I remember thinking, I wonder what it would be like to write a book that was meant to be that, read that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea is to slow down, pay attention, look around, listen. 
you can't do that plowing through. You have to slow down. And, um, and then one person actually said to me, it's kind of like a devotional. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, I'm like <laughs> seven years old watching my great grandmother read yeah. the upper room. Right. Remember the upper room? Oh, yeah. Maybe there still is an upper room. There is. Yeah. I don't read that now, but my grandmother, then my great grandmother read it completely faithfully, day by day by day. Every month, a new devotional. And then they had special ones for Advent. Um, but I, I wanted to think, what happened with late migrations is sort of a family story interspersed with essays about the natural world that echo or pick up on um, events or themes in the human world. And also toward the end of that book tour, people were saying, you've made me pay more attention to the, to the animals in my yard or nearby. And it's given me so much peace. And I realized I do, I do want people to feel that. But I also want them to know the urgency um, that I feel and that anybody who's paying attention is feeling right now about what we can do to save those creatures that we love. And I didn't feel that I was as direct about it in late migrations as I wanted to be. It's wonderful when people fall in love with the natural world. But the next step has to be, what can I do? And I thought I needed to be more transparent about that. But now we get to the praise songs. I didn't want it to be just a depressing book. <laughs> I wanted it to be happy and joyful. I wanted, I wanted to convey the feeling I feel. Because even knowing what I know, I can't help but feel joyful at the sound of a bird singing or a flower blooming or the forest floor greening up in springtime. And so those that's what the praise songs are. So they're very um, deliberate celebrations of that joy. That's the idealistic reason. The pragmatic reason is that when you want art to be in your book and you want the art to, uh, the, the designer wants the art always to follow on the left-hand side mm. of the spread, what happens when the essay doesn't leave room for the art? Then you figure out, you throw in a little lanyard in there, pushes the text forward, and then lets the art fall where it should fall. So that's that's the totally pragmatic reason for it. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry. Well, we did come to hear you talk about the <laughs> Well, you asked the hardest question right off the bat. Oh, I, I well, really? <laughs> oh, wait, they're going to get hard. <laughs> well, possibly more incoherent. You know, it, it just, the book is just such a, um, it goes everywhere. So, you know, one of the notes I made that in thinking of, about getting to ask you directly uh, is um, that the, it's, uh, the dramas that play out in your um, bluebird's nest box feels like the metaphor for the human condition. And, um, you know, it's really, I was kind of clinging to this book this month. I, I go out in my yard every morning to see what's happening in my garden. It's, um, I am making, uh, it's this third year of being, you know, intentionally more native plants and, and figuring out. <laughs> um, is that Jean back there? Um, try, you know, so it's always an adventure, like what's going on out here and what am I going to find? And, but, you know, I've just walked through the room where I've heard NPR as I've headed out the door and I've awakened with my own, you know, demons. So, um, and I've taken to bringing your book out there with me, and I've literally been reading to this um, chrysalis that is there. And uh, it just seems like even though you talk about serious things, like little baby bluebirds get, you know, eaten by uh, the, the rat snake or the other, the wrens, is it? I forget which are the bad ones. Um, they're not bad. They're not bad. <laughs> they're, they're, they're bad. My husband says that too. Are, is that the good wren or the bad wren? And I say, 
no bad friends. Precisely. <laughs> so, so, but it just, it feels like it gives grounding. It's like, I don't know if this is really anthropomorphizing. I don't think it is. I think it's a, more of a, I think it's a different thing. But I'm wondering about that. Like how, are you conscious of like the multiple layers that are evoked by these stories? You know, that whole question of anthropomorphizing the natural world is one I, I really do struggle with because in a purely, I guess, scientific sense of, of about which I should not even attempt to talk because I have no scientific training at all. But it seems to me that the the idea behind anthropomorphizing, the, the accusation that some, a writer has anthropomorphized the natural world has to do with ascribing human mm -hmm. motivations and um, feelings to wild animals. And I just think that's so such nonsense because, because it comes in some ways from the belief that we are exceptional, <laughs> that we are ourselves as a species somehow set apart from the natural world, that our motivations are all reasonable and um, thought out and and that our behavior is always grounded by a plan. And I, you're chuckling, and I think you're, you should must surely be chuckling because that is not our species. <laughs> that is what we like to tell ourselves about ourselves, but it is not true. We are also motivated by hormonal. We're, our behavior is generated by hormones. Our response to the natural world is often very atavistic. We get we get uh, we get all our backs up because we feel attacked when no attack is actually happening. There are there are very primitive things happening to us because we are we are ourselves part of the natural world. So I do reject to a certain degree that idea that when I say I get this accusation all the time. So maybe I am feeling a little attacked sometimes <laughs> in the comments of the New York Times. But the truth is that I feel, you know, when you have been observing your nearby wild neighbors closely over enough time, you do, you can't help but notice that some of those blue jays are a lot more mischievous than others, that some of the skinks are more calculating, that some of the squirrels are definitely bolder, that some of them have extremely fine-tuned problem-solving, you know, capacities, and the others just seem kind of dumb. I mean, that's <laughs> like us, you know, so I, I do bristle a little bit about that because I think that it, it, that question starts from a position that's a very dangerous one. I'm not saying that their needs, their wants uh, supersede our own, but I'm saying that they are in every way as urgent to those creatures as our needs and wants are to us. And, and I also think that we are really reckless metaphor make, makers as a species. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible for us not to see a lesson in something that really doesn't have anything to do with us. We just observed it, but we see it as something we can learn from. And that to me is an anthropomorphizing. Mm -hmm. That's just learning. Thanks for not calling me crazy. <laughs> um, you share in this book various times when you were younger, like even when you were a kid, um, where you have tried interventions to save various creatures that have mostly not ended well. Um, I mean, you know, because, well, I, I'm not going to, you talk about that and, and um, the humbling aspect of that and the, and the kind of, uh, what's the word for it? Like, just like, you're trying to do the right thing, but ultimately um, that phrase nature takes its course kind of, you know, like you have, you've meddled really with the, 
with the with the master plan. Uh, and I'm, you know, I think all of us, you know, rescued a cat this summer. I uh, I have, I believe, it is now resting in uh, icy peace. My chrysalis. I left it last night. I did not bring it in because I had read your book, and I thought I'm not going to make this creature's life work better. It's not even if it does become a butterfly a monarch in my house, it's too late for it to go to Mexico. It's not going to happen. So let somebody eat it who needs the fuel. Mm. But it's killing me. <laughs> it's just killing me. So, uh, but do you, would you talk about, about that? I think we have a lot of us here who try to be nice. It's um, a very hard world for the tender hearted. <laughs> I mean, it just is. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I, there's a story I tell in my first book about when my middle son, the first and the third sons did not go through this, at least not visibly. But my, there, someone had run over a, 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 a robin in, in a, on the street in front of our house, and we were taking a walk, and my three-year-old, then three or who's now 27, but he said, um, what is that? And I said, it's a bird, and he said, no, it isn't. It didn't look anything like a bird. It was squished. And I said, but it is a bird. It's a dead bird. He said, that bird is dead. And then from then on, it was like off to the races. Like this was an idea that he found so incredibly incomprehensibly bad that it had to constantly be something that I ratified, you know, like all birds die. Yes, they do. All birds die. All dogs die. And it went on and on. All the people in the grocery store will die. And um, and I think, it, it, the, you know, I don't know if it was because at that particular moment when he saw that dead bird that it was his, you know, his developmental capacities had just gotten to the ability where he could kind of comprehend the idea of something like death. But it, he, he just found it absolutely unacceptable. And it is unacceptable. I mean, we, we can't help it. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to help, even in the face of something that's incontrovertible. The problem is when what we want to do is help because we've picked a favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, there's a story in the book, I'll just go ahead and warn you about it so when you get to it, you can skip over it if it's too painful. <laughs> But uh, 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 someone I know told me a story about watching a rat snake climb the bluebird box that she knew had baby birds in there. And she went out with the hedge clippers and cut that snake in half. Uh -huh. And I just, like, that story has haunted me. Because the rat snake, we, why, why do we prefer the bluebird? It's over the rat snake. You have to ask yourself that question. Why? Why the rat snake is just hungry? And there's no evil to it. The bluebirds are going to immediately start building a new nest. I mean, that's what they do. They they have in my yard four or five clutches a season. The world would fill up with bluebirds <laughs> so soon if there weren't predators. This is how it's all worked out. But it is so painful. For me, the, 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 the line has always been, I will intervene if what's happening is, is unnatural. It isn't part of a natural system. So if there's a feral cat in the yard hunting a bird, that's different. House cats are not part of any natural system. And animals did not, evade, did not evolve to evade house cats because there are no house cats in nature. So that's one thing. But the problem with the 21st century is that it's so hard to tell now what's natural and what's something we did in a wrongheaded way. Um, you know, the truth is you could, there wouldn't have, no good could have come from bringing the, that chrysalis in because there would be no flowers for that butterfly because they're going to die at the same, you know, but it, I had that same conversation with myself right before I left because there are Chris, there are um, Gulf Fritillary chrysalises still in my passion vine. Um, 
but there's nothing to be done about it. It got cold, winter comes. I think that's a good distinction about the, is it something that was our fault to begin with in a way? Or not even necessarily our fault. Like if, if a bluebird nests in a box that you put out in the middle of your yard, there is nothing in nature that is natural about that scenario. It's natural in the sense that you put it up there because you're aware that na native natural nesting sites are imperiled in our, you know, take the chainsaw out world. But it's not natural in the sense that it, because it doesn't have any disguises built in. So I always put a snake back along the pole because not because I have anything against the snakes, but because that that those baby birds are, are sitting ducks because of where I put that box mm -hmm. and the fact that it is a box and <coughs> a woodpecker's hole in a tree with all kinds of built in camouflage. So your baffle is actually the thing you're doing because you put, yeah, attracting the. I mean, you can say that th this yeah. is a like a, a you need a philosophy PhD to sort through all of the kinds of things that can rise up in this, in the quandaries that can arise in this situation. Yeah. So taking it to uh, maybe a broader lens, though, um, you said something. Um, I think this, there were a couple different interviews I watched with you, but one, uh, you, you said we don't, um, work to preserve what we don't care about, and um, and then talking about like uh, I think like on the bit in the bigger sense to get people to be aware of the world around us, the natural world, the the, the stuff that is is imperiled by our uh, reckless growth, and um, that uh, like you said that we're convinced when we are moved more often than when we are merely informed. And I think you were, this is a PBS yeah. interview you did that in, you were talking about your book, I think, um, and the way you write is how it's different than just a scientific listing of the things. You know? I remember now, what, what, what I was trying to think, when did I say that? And I remember exactly <laughs> now when I said that because it was an interview with Jeffrey Brown for PBS and he said, you're, you write personal essays. And I said, that's true. And he said, why? Mm -hmm. like, like, why should anybody care about what happened to you in your backyard? Like, which is a classic kind of um, true journalist approach to this question. Like why, why begin with a story? And that's the answer that I gave. That I begin with a story because I think that we are storytelling creatures. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's a reason Jesus taught in parables. Mm -hmm. We pay attention when our imagination is fired or our moral um, faculties are engaged. We we are much more apt to save what we love than what we've just um, observed. Like I, you know, I'm not. I, I don't. Love, there's no polar bear in my life. And so I can go a whole day without thinking about how sad it is that there is almost no chance that polar bears will survive in the wild. They can't, they need ice and the ice is disappearing. But I know that the flock of cedar waxwings that comes to my American holly tree in December is growing smaller with every year. I know that I feel that. And so I don't have, I don't have scientific knowledge. I don't have an icebreaker ship. I don't have very much to offer, but I thought maybe that is something I could do. Uh, maybe there's a chance I can make some readers love what I love. And if they do, maybe they will feel moved to do something. There's so, there's so many ways we cause harm without knowing that we're causing harm because we have no idea who we're harming. 
you know, for years I took the broom and I washed, the, I, I, I swept the cobwebs mm -hmm. out of the window frames in the fall. You know, it's not for nothing that spider web, fake spider webs decorate everybody at Christmas time. It's because this is spider season. I mean, the spider webs are everywhere. But when you do that, you take the egg sacs mm -hmm. with them and, and you destroy the egg sacs, mm -hmm. trying to make a tidy house. So much harm that we do is in our own immediate habitats is just in the service of tidiness. It's not because someone's hungry. You know, I'm not, I'm not even dressing the question of what to do about insecticides in agriculture. I'm just saying, why does your grass have to be a putty green? That's not that hard. That's right. You know, just so, in fact, it's so much easier to do good mm -hmm. than to do harm. Well, that's what's so beautiful about your writing is that we are storytellers. We need stories to understand everything, and and um, as opposed to only you know scientific recitation of facts. In um, in writing school, there there's like you know there's the that's what happened. That's sort of science, and then there's the but what is it about? And that's what gets to the heart of the matter, and that's the story, and that's what we need to put things in context, or that's what moves us. You're like, this is, in terms of activism, you're a cultural worker. I like that so much. <laughs> Instead of just an ignoramus who doesn't know science. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I wouldn't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> no, listen, y'all, I had to drop out of biology 101 twice <laughs> in college because I could not get respiration. Like, I could not. <clears throat> but I made an A in environmental biology if that makes you feel better about it. <laughs> well, yeah, it does, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, I'm sure some folks have some questions oh, they'd yeah. like to uh, ask. And um, did you, was that an immediate hand? Yeah. 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 All right. May I call on you? Sure you may. Okay. Uh, I, everything you're talking about reminds me of being a, a lifelong second grader in that there are questions that I see and you bring them up that I don't know the answers to and I don't know anyone who can give the answer. But there is one topic set that seems to apply to almost everything you're talking about. And it's two words that are familiar to psychiatrists and psychologists. And it's the two words are nature and nurture. And finding out how they affect one another and how much attention should be given so that the two of those can combine in a way that makes sense. And I hear that coming from you because you keep talking about the things you don't know and the things you do know. And does one apply to the other? And how should we, if we don't know something, should we look at that? Because sometimes we don't. Does that make sense to you that you're doing things like that? I don't know. I, I, I don't, that nature nurture thing, I don't know that, I, I agree. I don't think anybody's ever gonna answer that question. It's probably some of both always, but um, did it turn itself off again? Yeah, it's red. Now it's green again. Um, you know, the climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, she lives in Lubbock, Texas. She's married to an evangelical pastor, and she's one of the premier climate scientists in, in our country. And she tells a story about giving a talk uh, to a group of students a big auditorium full of students and somebody raised their hand and said are you a democrat or are you a republican and she said i'm a canadian <laughs> but she she can't understand how these questions became so politicized in our country and but she makes a distinction between people who are worried about climate change and biodiversity loss and people who are worried about climate change and biodiversity loss and activated to do something about it. And the pe most people now are worried. The, the polls show that people are worried or very worried about it. 
but most people don't know what to do about it. And she says that if you give people the tools to do something about it, if that just means talking to somebody um, about something that is going to be, be hard if we don't address this, are our kids going to be able to play soccer anymore in Texas mm -hmm. if it keeps getting hotter and hotter? And I think that's such a good distinction. Not so much that is, is, are we motivated by nature or more by nurture, but what can we do? Because for me, every time I figured out something to do, no matter how small, it's made me feel so much better. It's made me happier. It's made me feel hopeful. So I plant my first pollinator, small pollinator bed with just the basic stuff you can get from Home Depot or Lowe's um, because there was nowhere else to shop because people haven't been going to their garden centers or, or and saying, I want native plants. I want native plants to feed my native wildlife. And so just like creating a market for something does good, but you plant those cone flowers and you see the bees getting the pollen, you see the butterflies getting the nectar, and later you see the cone flo the, the goldfinches hanging on it while that cone flowers waving around in the wind like, like it's a buck and bronco picking out seeds. And you just are thrilled. Like that, none of that would have happened if you hadn't sought out purple cone flower and planted it in your yard and not sprayed it with any poison. It's just so simple. But this, the thing is, it's a ladder. Like there's no point, it's kind of like, if they talk about, speaking of psychology, they talk about, you know, I can't remember what it's called, but no matter, like that people get trapped in this cycle of achievement where if they get to a certain goal, then they, instead of, luxuriating in that try in, in that triumph immediately looking at the next rung up on the ladder but this is the good kind of ladder you know like you plant the purple cone flower you go i wonder if i put milkweed out there if a monarch would come and then you start look reading up on monarchs you realize oh my gosh i live in the middle of a major migration corridor for monarchs any milkweed i put out there is gonna find a taker and then that you look out the window and there's a monarch and you're just like happy. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me go with uh, you first and then in back. Um, you'll, you'll be the second one and then right. I'm right in front of you. Yes. So I was just really struck by um, this idea of slowing down and looking in your backyard. And it really reminds me a lot of the pandemic when a lot of us were forced to slow down and instead of going into the office every day, my office was my breakfast counter, which looked into my backyard. And so it kind of forced me to be more in touch with what was going on in the backyard and really focus on my immediate surroundings and environment um, in a way that I hadn't before. And I just wonder, do you think that the pandemic played a role in this work at all? And did it force you to slow down or um, and do you think I'm wondering if it had I know that the pandemic had a temporary improvement on the environment because people weren't driving as much and weren't going out but I'm wondering if if you know I feel like we've lost that message as we've kind of moved away and things have opened up again is there a way to hold on to it well it, it has to be an act of intention I think um, because it's true um, it didn't really change anything about me, except that there were people in my workspace for the first time. Like I've been working from home for 27 years, but then my husband was teaching from home. My two, two, my, my two younger sons were home Zooming with their offices. Um, that was an adjustment, but for most people, had, most people had that same experience. It's so much so that there was actually a shortage of bird food in March of 2020, like so many people had ordered, uh, I mean, partly that was the supply chain issues that we all, but it was also because it was like a massive run on bird food. And, you know, like there was bird food price gouging. 
in March 2020 because so many people wanted bird food. But the other things we were, I think that we were disenchanted with our screens during the lockdowns. If you, your entire work day was in front of a screen at the end of the work day, you did not want to turn on the TV. You wanted to go for a walk and going for a walk was one of the few things that we were told was safe to do. So a lot of it was reinforcing that slowing down, um, observing. And it, I got to where I couldn't even go to my favorite trail because there were so many people on it, they were spoiling the experience for me. Um, but, you know, when you have to fight your way in traffic to an office, pick kids up from soccer, you know, it, it's very easy to lose that knack again. Uh, it's very easy to lose that knack. My, um, one of my neighbors with young children said, I just love this pandemic. And, I, and she goes, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but we don't have, we don't have any piano lessons. We don't have any soccer games. We don't have any um, parent meetings. And I was thinking the whole time, you know, you can say no to some of that stuff. They don't all have to, you know, have, they don't have to have every afternoon filled. In fact, you know, the world would be better if they didn't, but I, I didn't. I can't <laughs> Um, but I do think we need to do this because we have not evolved to move at this speed. And when you are outside, you have to be still. You have to be quiet or you scare everything away. And when you're still and you're quiet, you, your heart rate slows, your blood pressure drops. It's better for you. Yes. I just want to primarily thank you for the ongoing quality of your work at the Times. We've read the column for years, our whole family, and your tone is always so wise and genuine and humble and on target, whether it's the seasons of the world or the seasons of the, the kind of natural life cycle. And one of my questions is, the Times is clearly very cautious about their permanent columnists, is post-pandemic, is there any collegiality or cross fertilization, or do you actually meet occasionally in New York to, to engage each other? I mean, what is that like for you to kind of be part of that high quality stable and be a different voice, but a high quality voice? Is there any kind of peer connection, or can you can you speak about that a little bit? Everybody works from home. Yeah, <laughs> like everybody. So and are scattered all around. Um, so you, you never meet in the city. But, I, you know, I have to say, I have to, I have to be very clear about something. I'm not a columnist. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it, it's not a distinction that makes a lot of sense outside the very small group of people who run the New York Times. But <laughs> columnists are employees of the newspaper, and they have obligations aside from what they write in, in the paper. Some of them write twice a week, some of them write once a week, but they also do um, live responses um, on election nights, for example. Right. They all have expertise in some, uh, some matter of policy or politics. I have none of that. I'm a freelancer with a contract. And I have an editor who has to approve everything I write. And, um, and so in some ways, I'm the beast spring. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not sitting on on the player's bench. And I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> every year my editor says, frequency is pretty regular. it's every Monday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it is in fact more regular than some of the columnists. But the thing is, I don't have a PhD in sociology, Thank like a, uh, or, or a specialty right, right. in how right. the courts are organized and behave and know the whole history of that. I am a generalist and that's, all I ever want to be. I don't want to achieve mastery of one subject. Right. And um, so I can't tell you whether they have a collegiality because I'm not in that club. Okay. One more question. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, maybe if we have. I'll, I'll promise to answer faster. Okay. <laughs> oh, I so we can do all three. Yes. I noticed that you, when I think about your writing, I think about obviously the beautiful nature personal connection to the wholeness of life. There is a spirituality quality to it, and yet it's universalist. 
it's not a particular brand. But as a pastor, um, you don't know how many times I use your stuff. <laughs> because it is just incredible. But then you're also a politician. You may not want to claim it, but you talk about politics. Hmm. And I'm wondering how you decide which, what you're going to focus on and how you weave all of that together. Well, when I when they first approached me about writing regularly, as opposed to just whenever I sent something and they bought it, that I, they needed a tagline because all the regular writers, all the contributing opinion writers, had a little tagline, and 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 I suggested flora and fauna of the American South because that's what I've been writing about, and that when it came out. In print, for the first time, it said "Flora, Fauna, Politics, and Culture of the American South." I thought, oh. <laughs> okay, so that's the job description now. It's a little different, but it's still "Flora and Fauna" is still my where my heart really lies. But this is a big platform, and with that platform comes some ethical responsibilities. And I don't think I can turn a blind eye to something that's happening in my region, especially in my state, um, that is going to have an impact on people outside of that. Gun laws in Tennessee don't affect just people in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't ever set foot in the state of Tennessee, our gun laws allow people who own guns in Tennessee to ship them to California off books without a background check to anybody who orders one. There are all kinds of loopholes like that that affect the rest of the country. And so I do think it's my responsibility sometimes. Um, you know, if, if I can see that nobody else is going to do it, then I have to do it. Thank you. Hold on just a second. We got, well, well can you guys get on the same page maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a physician, and I'd be happy to talk to you about respiration. <laughs> the part I was having trouble with was the plants. <laughs> do you know how plants do it? <laughs> no, really, I do actually know how it happens now. I just maybe at age 22 wasn't quite ready for it. <laughs> but if you hit my guilt with sharing my uh, house with the spider webs, mm. and so I have had chipmunks who have moved in my downspouts and are moving up into the roof and I'm not comfortable with letting them build their homes in there, and yet the critter control people are going to put uh, pesticide or you know whatever rodenticide outside. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's the, the the rodenticides that are being used today are many thousand times more powerful than the rat poison that you all probably grew up with, and it enters the food chain. Mm -hmm. yes. It's much more humane and it's much safer for the world to just trap them and kill them. Oh. But here's what I would urge you to do. Let them stay for the winter and then help them move out. The, the best thing to do with unwanted housemates is to figure out where they're getting in. Oh, I know where they're getting in. And yeah. stop it. Yeah, yeah. right. Down has a black uh, rubber tubing that comes out and then nibbles it. But they don't, I don't think you have chipmunks, honestly. Chipmunks burrow underground. But if they are chipmunks, they won't stay. They really won't. We have squirrels that occasionally decide that our attic over our bedroom is the exact perfect place to store their acorns for the winter. They always leave and forget the acorns are there. It's, it really has never, ever, ever been a problem. I just do nothing. Nothing is so easy to do. You just don't have to. It's just you, you go. You decide. They charge you for it. There are. If you ask around, if you call a local wildlife rescue organization, they will know the name of a critter control that does a humane remove. And by humane, I don't mean trap it and take it out to the woods. I mean find out whether it has young, which it won't this time of year. But um, and patch the hole and get rid. Of it. So. Um, we had, was there, was it you? Okay. I think, I don't know. And then we should wrap it up. I'll be quick. That's okay. Um, just to follow up on the two nice people. Can I hear you? Uh, just to, I'll uh, repeat the question. Just to follow up on the two people that spoke about the New York Times. Um, as a, 
a fellow Tennessean and a mostly displaced Southerner for most of my life. I so appreciate what you have had to write, what you've said about politics and culture in the South, because it's hard to defend Southerners sometimes mm -hmm. when you live elsewhere. Yes. And so it's I, also um, hard when you live there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. There is a lot. To, there's a lot not to like um, about other parts of the country as well. But you know, I just I appreciate you so much, and um, and I look forward to both these books at Epic Race Room. So thank you. Thank you. She just wanted to say um, thank you for suggesting to the rest of the country that not all Southerners are, you know, people. <laughs> I, I would suggest possibly that that's such a convenience of Northerners to um, deflect from our own horrible behavior. To point things oh, yeah. Somebody. I mean, every time somebody says, oh, you're just, uh, everybody in there is a racist, I'm going to go, you want to just guess where George Floyd lived? You know, like, yeah, they're a racist. If you think race, the Southerners are racist, I, I will totally agree with you. But I will also say everybody where you live is also a racist. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not, we, we don't have a particular um, moratorium on that particular um, sadness. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> we have, uh, we will move you to a table. I think maybe over here it's easier for audience.